Welcome to the MSME Radio Network. The broadcast shows are for informational and entertainment purposes only. They are not designed to provide listeners with specific personal, medical, or counseling advice. Individuals with a medical issue should always consult their health care provider. MSME is not responsible for content of individual shows. The views expressed by show hosts or their guests are their own. Enjoy the show. Welcome to MSME Interviews. I am your host, Erica Lyons Richardson. Today we are continuing our hashtag We Have MS series for 2018. Our topic today is edition three of questions we have received from patients who have been recently diagnosed around the globe. The questions have come in through our various social media platforms and forums. What has been the most surprising is the lack of basic disease information provided to these patients when first diagnosed. That was revealed through their questions and comments on our forums. They had no idea that the most common MS symptoms were in any way disease related. Also concerning was their confusion on what their response should be when one of these symptoms would arise. When do we call our doctor or nurse? How long do we wait? When should we go to the ER? Navigating basic life with MS was becoming very stressful due to lack of knowledge. That's when the officers of MSME Media decided to start compiling the most often observed questions on our social media and bring those to you in a Q&A format several times during 2018. As a disclaimer, some of the questions are being answered by fellow patients who have been living with MS for decades and not by our medical professionals. Of course, our medical professionals do not see you personally and cannot diagnose any of your symptoms. It is our hope that the information you hear will open a dialogue and you and your personal physician will have that conversation. Let's get started on our edition three questions. The first one is, I have been diagnosed with MS and I had tingling in my hands, electric shock and vertigo, but what else can I expect with MS? Will I get all of the MS symptoms? You know, that's a very good question. There are around 50 or more common MS symptoms uh, that we often discuss, you know, online with the other people living with MS around the globe, and at least 90 that I know of personally in total. But not every patient will experience all of them, and here's why. Location of the damage. Each case of MS is different, and our immune systems attack themselves at different points, at different locations, in different at different intensities. Now, let's discuss some of these symptoms. We'll just go through the short list of the more common ones today. Sensory problems. We can have abnormal sensations. We can have numbness, tingling, burning, tightness, a tight pulling. Pins and needles, that sensation when you sit on your foot too long and when you have your legs crossed. Severe itchiness. You know, this one can be actually quite severe for some patients. They'll dig and dig at their skin during the night to the point that they sometimes even bleed. Hypersensitivity to touch. When you think about that, that's not only annoying and painful, it can actually affect relationships if we're constantly pulling away at the lightest touch. It can really be quite debilitating, and sometimes even embarrassing, although it shouldn't be, but it can be personally embarrassing. Loss of um, sense of body position in space. Um, You know, I've seen uh, different uh, MS conferences where the speaker will even demonstrate how, and I can completely relate, how they will, you know, knock their hands or shoulders on doorways because they no longer have that sense of their body position in space due to that damage, that neurological damage. I have had so many bruises on, you know, the top of my hand, 
the, the corner of my shoulder, uh, you know, bumping toes. I just don't know that, boom, I'm walking halfway into the doorway instead of through it. Now, um, inability to detect vibrations. Uh, impaired sense of taste or smell. That's a big one for many. Uh, trigeminal neuralgia, which is a stabbing pain in the face. This one is not nicknamed the suicide disease for no reason. It can be horrifically debilitating. For some MSers, it's actually their most debilitating symptom. What happens is it's damage to your fifth cranial nerve, which wraps around from the back of your head all the way, you know, down through under your eyes, around your cheeks, under your chin. I mean, it can sometimes be as light as you think you have some kind of tooth or um, gritting your teeth issue. It can be just like a sensation of maybe you have some ear pain, like you have an ear infection. Uh, it can be a little bit of facial droop even. It can be sensitivity to the slightest brush or touch across your face. Or it can be more severe cases where you can't move, smile, speak, uh, air blow across your face, anything without extreme pain. And it can be difficult to treat. Now this is most commonly on one side, but it can be like in my case where it's on both sides. I have bilateral. Uh, Lair um, let's see, the electrical shock-like sensation um, running down your spine and into your limbs when you bend that neck forward or backwards, that just, boom, that electrical shock. That can actually be a common first symptom. Uh, the MS hug. Uh, the MS hug has been described in so many ways, but most people um, will commonly describe it as that kind of girdling effect, that squeezing tight effect can be even be pressure, can even be little shoots of pain. Um, in extreme cases, it can be mistaken for a heart attack. And I always like to tell MSers, especially those of you new to being diagnosed with MS, if you feel that pain and pressure in your chest and not just in your rib area, and you think it's a heart attack, there's any possibility it could be one and you're not sure, go to the ER. Because better safe than sorry, we have lost members of our MS community that way who mistook a heart attack, you know, for the MS hug and they were wrong. So always better safe than sorry. But in most cases, it's just that tight squeezing, oh, it's hard to take in a full breath feeling. So it, it can last minutes to hours. Even some people have experienced it, you know, on and off over the course of days. So it can definitely um, be a severe symptom. Uh, we can have uh, motor problems, uh, loss of strength or muscle weakness, uh, loss of muscle tone. Um, and we can even have increased muscle tone. Uh, so we can actually have limbs that become limper or with spasticity they can tighten up and become stiff where it's even hard to bend our feet or bend our legs it's hard to bend our wrists so we can have um, temporary or more permanent bouts of spasticity where we become uh, completely hard to bend and move so spasticity is kind of continuously contracted muscles or muscle spasms if you're not familiar with that term. Uh, myoclonus, which is sudden involuntary muscle contractions. A tremor, so tremor, we can have those. A foot drop, a foot drop is where uh, your foot actually drops down and uh, you'll actually kind of drag it even when you're walking and not even realize it. Uh, problems walking, uh, like I said, impaired gait. Uh, mobility problems, um, the wobble, the swaying to one side when you're trying to walk. Uh, there's so many uh, walking issues we can have. Um, paralysis, which is one of the more severe symptoms, especially with spinal cord lesions. Uh, we can have, uh, you know, uh, paraplegia, quadriplegia. Um, so you can even, now some people get confused by those terms 
They think a paraplegic is always, uh, you know, paralyzed from the waist down. They can't move at all. Quadriplegics, you know, they're paralyzed from the neck down. They can't move at all. But actually, uh, that's a broad term. Um, and can quadriplegia and quadriplesis can mean weakness in all four limbs. So you can sometimes have movement, but not a lot of strength and control. Uh, same thing for paraplegia. In your legs, you can just have weakness of both legs and lack of control, um, but you can have movement. So there, that that does kind of that's an umbrella of a um, diagnosis where um, it can be various stages of paralysis. Loss of balance, that's a big one. Oh, the falls with MS can be so, so dangerous. Um, and they can increase over time as we progress. So that can be an issue when people say, well, I don't wanna use a cane, or I don't wanna use a walker, I don't wanna use a wheelchair or scooter, uh, that's giving up. No, you have to kind of look at it differently. If your doctor or your physical therapist has prescribed uh, an assistive device for you to prevent falls, number one, it's keeping you safe from breaking something or worse. Number two, it's, look at it as freedom because if you get that walker, you get that wheelchair, that cane, you can spend more time out and about. You know, you can spend more time at social events and with your family and doing chores and working. And actually, my walker kept me at my job longer before I had to quit work. So they can actually be a tool of freedom and more independence. So it's not always giving up to use an assistive device. Um, loss of coordination. That's a big one. Oh, how many times I have dropped things and flipped things. <laughs> <laughs> bumped into things. I mean, just so many symptoms of lack of coordination. Now, cerebular um, ataxia can cause like gait ataxia, where our we are have that uncoordinated walking, um, nystagmus, that jittery eye movements. Um, some people will call them dancing eyes, where our eyes just shake back and forth or up and down, and it can cause quite a, a few vision problems. Um, you can have it in one eye or both. Um, I have it in both of my eyes, actually. And it can be mild or severe. And it can also be intermittent or kind of on a more permanent basis. So um, definitely speak to your eye doctor if you notice or a family member, more commonly, notices your eyes shaking back and forth. Uh, intention tremor. Shaking when you attempt fine motor movements. Um, I definitely have that. That's a big one for me. Uh, reaching for something and you start to shake or trying to control it and press pressure and it will shake. Um, trying to get trunk control, head and trunk control, you know, setting up or turning your head and then that's when you'll shake. Uh, hypotonia. Inability to maintain steady posture, which I was just uh, describing. Uh, inability to maintain a steady rhythm. On something uh, with your voice with everything any steady rhythm everything can get kind of broken broken movements broken voice um, reduce control of range of motion uh, that can be very debilitating it results over time um, kind of undershooting limb movements uh, changes in our speech production that has been a great challenge for me I have recently be, been doing very well in all of my therapies, and um, speech therapy did wonders for me. So did um, uh, the, uh, um, sorry, <laughs> brain moment with MS. Uh, so did the respiratory therapies I've been doing. Um, but speech production, including slurring of our words, unclear articulation of our words, and difficulty controlling loudness. Um, changes in voice quality, including hoarseness, breathiness, nasal tone, poor control of pitch. Some people uh, say that their voice gets deeper and raspier. Some people it gets a high pitch squeak. And you can barely make a voice at all. Um, dysphagia, uh, which is difficulty swallowing. That can be very dangerous and very concerning and, and worrisome for a lot of people with MS. Now, I've had both the changes in my voice, 
Um, I've been called Minnie Mouse years and years ago at work. Um, it's been an ongoing issue and struggle for me. If you watch my uh, awareness videos from just a couple years ago, you'll you'll hear me talking like this. I mean, I, I've come a long way, and it's been years and years of therapy and knowing, you know, what is causing it, how to maximize my voice power and my stamina. Now, the rest of the day after doing the show, I'll have trouble even making a voice. <laughs> I give all my voice power into this timing of medications, timing of rest, and then we can make a voice. <laughs> so all of that can go into it. Now, um, another thing we can have is loss of balance. Um, vertigo, which is dizziness, nausea, and vomiting. Um, so much that, you know, seasickness medicines are even used to treat it. It can be so horrible. It's more than just a little woo wooziness. It can be the world is spinning and will not stop. And it is such a horrible sensation. And sometimes it can be one little movement of your head and boom, you're just on this trip. It's so horrible when it happens. Um, now, sensory attacks, Zia, uh, like I said, the loss of that body position um, also goes uh, along with the inability to detect vibrations, Romberg signs. Those are all sense result of that sensory ataxia. Um, the vision problems all lumped together, um, like I've mentioned before, um, that if you want to go through a whole list of them, it could be optic neuritis, uh, which is loss of vision. You can get eye pain, diminished color vision, uh, flashes of lights, um, diplopia, double vision, blurred vision. Um, like I said, those flashes of light in your peripheral vision. So all of those things, and the nystagmus, uh, your eye crossing, one eye crossing, uh, the, all those things can happen with your vision. Um, so let's lump all the hearing issues together. Um, hearing loss, tinnitus, which is ringing in your ears, which can be horrific. I have it in both ears 24-7. Um, is there an easy treatment for it? No, unfortunately, there's not an easy treatment for it. Uh, white noise does help. Keeping some other type of white noise in the room so you're not concentrating on that ringing in the ear so it doesn't drive you nuts. But that's a great benefit. Um, abnor abnormal sensitivity to intolerance to everyday sound levels or noises. That one can be maddening. Especially when you have two very noisy boys. <laughs> or if you're in a crowded room and a lot of people are talking at once or making different noises. You literally sometimes want to cover your ears and just go, no, shut it off. It can be that horrible. Um, it's like it, because of the sensory damage in our brain, we cannot process all those sounds at once. It will drive us crazy. And making thought, <laughs> cognitive thought, holding a conversation and all those noises and stimulation coming in at once can be quite difficult. Now cognitive changes. That's something that really scares some patients. Uh, cognitive changes can include short-term, long-term memory problems, attention difficulties, slower speech, or informational processing speed. So sometimes it can just take us longer to process information we take in, or the information's in there, but to get it out, our speech sometimes slows down or becomes broken. Difficulty finding the right words, like I just did before. Um, problems with abstract concepts. Uh, confusion or just sensory overload, like we said with the sound. Now, we can also have emotional changes. This one can be even more impactful on relationships, friendships, uh, family members, uh, co-workers, loved ones. You know, your significant other. Depression. Depression is a big symptom of MS. MS has the highest suicide rate of any disease. We're talking cancer, Alzheimer's, all of them lumped in together. 
it has the highest suicide rate, very high depression rate. It is a symptom of the disease, but you can get help. There is treatment for that. So do not be ashamed to go to the doctor because this is a symptom of your disease. There is nothing to be ashamed of. Generalized distress and anxiety. So that can be treated as well. Mood swings and emotional mobility. I mean, we can just go from 0 to 20 in 2.2 seconds. Mood swings just, I mean, they can really impact our personal relationships. Uh, PBA, pseudobulbar affect. Uh, that's when you laugh or cry at inappropriate moments or you have just inappropriate reactions to things and you can't stop it and it's just out of the blue. Uh, bladder, bowel, and sexual dysfunction, urinary incontinence, hesitancy, urgency, frequency, retention, or leakage, just a total lack of control, uh, constipation, diarrhea, bowel incontinence where you cannot hold your bowels impotence, reduced libido, inability to achieve, to achieve an orgasm, just lack of sensation, or pain with sexual relations. All of those can deeply affect the relationship as well. But these things do have treatments and therapies. You need to mention these to your doctor. They are part of the disease and nothing to be ashamed of. Sleep disorders, insomnia, narcolepsy, restless leg syndrome, Nocturnal movements, uh, other sleep disorder like breathing disorders, uh, fatigue, headache, migraine, breathing problems. My lungs right now are down to 18%. Uh, heat sensitivity. Heat and cold intolerance can be so debilitating when you're going out and about. It cannot just be uncomfortable and bring on MS symptoms. Um, but it can also be dangerous if you're caught alone because if it brings on a severe reaction and you can't move, you can't go get help. And then your core temperature rises. And because of our nerve damage in our spine and those signals, that interruption of signal, our body can't do the process of cooling itself off and giving a proper reaction to heat and cold. And it can be very dangerous. Now, you can get um, cooling vest. For the heat intolerance, that is very helpful to keep you active and out and about. Um, seizures. Seizures can be a symptom. Now, as I stated earlier, there are so many more we can highlight. Just so many more. So, if you have anything new that you're concerned about might be MS, go and speak with your doctor. Open that dialogue. Now, if you experience these and more of the MS symptoms, that doesn't necessarily mean they are directly related to MS. Like UTIs are very common with MSers, but there can be many other causes for a UTI and it needs to be looked at, addressed, and find the source so it can be treated properly. Migraines are common with MSers, but the headache can be from another source that needs to be treated. So we need to Mention our new symptoms to our physicians so they can be looked at and, found, and the source can be found so we can get proper treatment. It's very, very important that we get that proper treatment and never be shy about mentioning a symptom. Even if you're thinking, this is so off the wall, I don't think anybody have this and this is so weird. No, mention it to your doctor because MS is a very, very complex disease, and we can often have other comorbidities, other conditions, other autoimmune diseases are very common. So mention it to your doctor. You never know if it's somehow related or if it's something else that needs to be looked at by another specialist. Okay, now we don't have time for our other questions that came in uh, this time, so we will table that for a later edition. So we'll go over um, keys in uh, diagnosis next time and why diagnosis would change. Why would a diagnosis change or why would it take so long once someone's, a doctor says you have MS, why would it take so long to say what type of MS? So we'll discuss that in our next edition. 
and uh, also answer some more of your questions. All right? So that will be on our future shows. So thank you for joining me this week on MSME Interviews. As I said, we're going to continue this series throughout 2018 as you submit your questions to us over social media or we see patterns of confusion in newly diagnosed patients uh, not knowing how to react or act you know, when these things happen to them or if they're confused by types of MS, symptoms, or things that are happening to them or treatment options available to them. So we'll break all that down in this hashtag we have MS series. And continue to use that hashtag on your social media. Hashtag we have MS has great meaning to our organization and to all the community that follows us and is part of MS and me. Think about it. We have MS. When we, the patient, have MS, our families have MS because they're greatly impacted by it emotionally, financially, and in every way. Our communities have MS because uh, the services we need, the health care we need, all of this impacts our communities. Uh, it impacts our countries because we're taken out of the workforce. You know, we're no longer sometimes gainfully employed um, once we get more progressed. So it can impact our communities and countries that way. The world has MS because MS is found around the globe and it's impacting, you know, families, communities, and financial situations, everything, workforces around the globe. So continue using hashtag WeHaveMS to bring awareness to that on your social media. Once again, thank you so much for joining me this week. For additional MS information, visit our website at www.msandmemedia.com. That's msandmemedia.com. Join me again next week on MS and Me Interviews.